Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. Andy, uh, Andy Alcoholic. I usually introduce myself with full name because usually... I'm not being recorded, so uh, um, I want to thank uh, Jamie for uh, asking me to come here tonight. She shanghaied me at the uh, area assembly last night when I was too tired to say no, um, so thank you. Um, and anyways, it is by the grace of God, the three legacies and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous have been sober since May 18th of 1990, and for that I'm truly grateful. Um, I currently serve you as, I serve you, you, you may not know this, I serve you as your uh, Area 72 secretary. I, so I serve you. You didn't know it. I serve you. Um, I'm from Bellingham. Uh, my home group is the Fairhaven Group. Uh, we are a uh, step study out of the big book. We're also a tradition study meeting as well. We also do a literature study on Sunday. Currently, we are reading one of the Grapevine books tonight, which I believe is... Um, no matter what, one of the newer ones. Uh, so anyways, so let's see, let's see. Experience, strength, and hope in a half hour with 25 years. Let's see if I can do that. I'm going to qualify a little bit and talk about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, I don't come from alcoholism. I don't come from abuse. I don't come from anything other than a working class family from the Midwest. Um, I was born in Iowa and lived in Iowa for the first 37 years of my life. And then I discovered that I could actually leave. <laughs> so usually when I tell people I'm from Iowa, they say, oh yeah, I dri- I've driven through Iowa once. And it's like, yeah, okay, okay. But, you know, the, re- the reason I say that, you know, um, you know, there, there's some peripheral sort of stuff in my family and I have a, I have a fairly big extended family and, uh, but apparently my, my, uh, great granddad, uh, was a drunk who owned a bar decades before Alcoholics Anonymous was even thought of. But, uh, so, you know, um, what I say is I was born broken, you know, that's basically all I can say because I never felt comfortable in my own skin from pretty much jump street. You know, there was always something, it was kind of, you know, it's it, it's kind of cliche, but, you know, it sort of felt like everybody had the script. Everybody had the script. Everybody knew what was going on. They knew what to say. They knew what to do. And they didn't feel like, they didn't seem like they were flying by the seat of their pants. I was always sort of making stuff up as I went and, and not doing a very good job of it either. And, uh, you know... I, you know, as I said, uh, I didn't come from an alcoholic home or abuse or anything like that. And, um, taught right from wrong, all this kind of stuff. And, and, but, you know, with all of this stuff sort of going on, um, you know, my dad, uh, working class guy drank his beer, you know, it's not an alcoholic. And, uh, you know, so, you know, if we had parties and stuff, I was always sort of, you know, on the, crawling around the tables, you know, stealing drinks out of, out of beers and stuff like that. And, and I always thought that was really kind of cool, you know? Um, so, you know, when I first took a drink with intent and, and again, you know, there wasn't uh, really hard liquor around my house. My, my, my mom liked to make these just awful frozen things for like holidays where there'd be like some rum or something in it. I, I, and I was always very disappointed that I didn't get to partake. But anyways, we had a log cabin syrup bottle when they were made of glass still with something in it. And I, you know, Kool-Aid, great mixer Kool-Aid, by the way. Um, and I, I poured it in there and I, you know, I was uh, 13 years old and uh, we got off early from school. And this is before the day of latchkey kids. So we, you know, when we came home, we pretty much had the run of the world till the parents came home. And, um, and, you know, I took that drink and, and I got a little more and the magic happened and it got me to normal. You know, that's what that's what alcohol did for me. It got me to normal. Um, there was no, you know, I, it wasn't about hiding. It wasn't about, you know, killing feelings. But I did like the fact that fear went away. 
you know, I did like the fact the fear went away. But, you know, once I got that buzz on and something happened from the, the, the top of my head to the tips of my toes, that this is how everybody must feel. And I don't mean drunk, but I just mean comfortable in their own skin. They know what's going on. And, you know, I know that's not true. I know everybody's got their own stuff, but that's what it seemed like. That's what it seemed like. That was my solution. That was my solution. Um, and I pursued it for as long as it worked and beyond, you know. And there was a lot of good times and there was a lot of confusing times. And and, and um, my whole life from a very early age revolved around alcohol. It wasn't a, a one-off thing. And I, and I was a disgusting pig of a drunk from pretty much Jump Street. And I would puke. You know, I was a morning after puker and all this kind of stuff and never, never stopped me, you know, and, and, uh, academically I was not, uh, too well inclined. I had other priorities going on as I was growing up and, and I pretty much, you know, um, my, I had, I have two older siblings and, and, uh, my parents weren't quite prepared for me. Um, they, uh, you know, they tried to you know, help me as best they could with various things. But, you know, I just, I still kind of just did what I wanted. It didn't matter what they, you know, how they censured me or, or grounded me or whatever. I was still going to do what I was going to do because that's the way I was going to do it. And I had to play good boy occasionally and kind of toe the line and all that kind of stuff because I wasn't a slash and burn kind of drunk. You know, I wasn't somebody who just said, oh, screw you, I'm going to, you know, and, and leave, you know, as a teenager and go live on the street because I didn't want to live on the street. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want, believe me, the easier, softer way was what I coveted. I coveted the easier, softer way and I manipulated and did all the things I could to keep the easier, softer way in front of me for as long as I possibly could. Um, graduated high school with absolutely no aspirations of anything other than to continue to do what I was doing before. Um, and no colleges were, you know, looking for me. I had a, like a 1.9 grade point average, and that was through lots and lots and lots of cheating. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you know, they talk about, you know, uh, you, people might talk about you know, crossing the line. And, and, you know, there I don't think in terms of, oh, I crossed the line. I wasn't alcoholic, and then I became alcoholic. Where I crossed the line is where it worked, and then it stopped working. You know, that's where things got really interesting at a very young age. And, and, you know, it was probably around 18, 19 in that neck of the woods. And the problem with when that happened to me is when that happened was exactly about the time the little bit in doctor's opinion came into play, is that alcoholics drink because they like the effect produced by alcohol, Right. Um, and while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. Their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And that's where that got me. Because, you know, soon after that happened, the sense of normal that alcohol provided was very short-lived. It basically stopped after the first drink. There was that sense of ease and comfort at the drink. And then after that, all bets were off because there was no more feeling normal. Fear was there, you know, and, and, and you know, it, by then it had its hooks into me and there was no, there was no stopping at that point in time. And, 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 and very frankly, I didn't know anything about alcoholism. I didn't know, I didn't know what I was experiencing. The drug and alcohol classes we had in the mid, early mid eighties were a joke. You know, it was, it was taught by a nun, you know, and she, you know, spouted every cliche about living under bridges and all this kind of stuff. So if I wasn't living under bridges and doing this or doing that, then I was just fine, you know. Um, but one of the things that couldn't be ignored is that I could not not get arrested. <laughs> I'm one of these guys, I don't know what it is, maybe it's a look on my face, that cops just love to make an example of. Actually, everybody of authority likes to make an example of me. That's and, it, you know, it had absolutely nothing to do with what I was doing at the time, you know, but, but, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't stay out of jail. And, and I wasn't like, you know, I was ripping and roaring. I was, you know, a petty thief. I was, you know, 
aggravated misdemeanor was my thing. You know, I mean, and it was all drunk related and sometimes not drunk related, but alcoholism related because, you know, I believe that it's illegal until you get caught. And so, again, I did whatever I sort of felt like doing. And if it, you know, I got away with it, it was fine. If it wasn't, I wasn't immoral, I was amoral. I had my own sort of moral compass that pointed, I don't know where, you know. Um, and, you know, and I'm, and the weird thing is I'm living at home during all of this stuff. And my parents have absolutely no idea what the hell's going on. And I didn't have any idea what was going on. I thought it was, I was, I was slowly going crazy, you know. I, 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 I didn't know what to call this thing. And, you know, I'm getting arrested and s certain people are starting to get interested in me being arrested all the time. Because, again, that wasn't what uh, my, my family, you know, uh, was about. Um, so, um, you know, higher power intervenes in very uh, dramatic ways when we're not paying attention. And mine continually uh, interrupted me. Um, and got my attention through the Waterloo Police Department. Um, and um, Waterloo, I was saying, is, is an industrial town, or at least it used to be anyway, as kind of like a, a town like uh, Bruce Springsteen would write about, only it's in Iowa instead of New Jersey. Um, but kind of like that, hard drinking kind of kind of place. So, But I got, I, I got a couple DWIs about a year apart, and I got arrested by the same cop. Now, the, now, Waterloo's not Mayberry. It's not, you know, Metropolis, but it's not Mayberry. So the idea, and the guy remembered me for some weird reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I looked like I was 12 years old at the time. Uh, 80s porn stash and mullet not uh, was standing. But um, the the guy said, I think you got a problem. A cop, you know, I think you got a problem. I, I, I'm guessing he probably saw a fair amount of problems through the course of his day. And it's like, uh, you know, so whatever. And, you know, as all this stuff is going on and, and, and it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult for me to be employable um, and just all of this stuff is starting to happen and it's starting to affect my family and all of that. And, and you know, I didn't, I didn't really care. Uh, my mom was a very erratic sleeper, not because of me, but she was a very erratic sleeper. And she was always up late. And um, she'd wake up in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. And I'd always have to wait until she was out of the kitchen before I came in. Because I just didn't want to talk with her sometimes, you know, when I'd come in. And I didn't hide anything. It was just I didn't want to have to deal with it. So I'd, you know, wait until the kitchen light went off and I'd pass out in the, you know, the neighbor's garden or something, you know. And, and, and um, but I do remember this. I remember one night coming in and my mom having some talk and, and, I remember my mom saying, you know, Andy, she goes, I love you. I just don't like you. And, you know, it's, oh, that'd be so heartbreaking. And I'm sitting there thinking, so what? I'm not here for you to like, you know. And that was my attitude. I had this great sense of entitlement along with everything else, right? And because the world's here to take care of me, thank you very much, and so are you, you know. And it's your fault for not providing exactly what I wanted at every given, you know. And, you know, so, you know, I was just a punk. I didn't say that, but that's what was running through my drunken mind at the time. So, fate intervenes through the Waterloo Police Department. It also intervenes through the Black Hawk County Correctional Facility, which I was invited to attend for uh, uh, what they call maximum benefits. Uh, and uh, so there was where my life was going. And uh, I was 22 at the time. And uh, no real moment of clarity at that point in time. I was just going to play a good boy. And this was a work release sort of thing. It wasn't uh, Attica or anything like that. And, uh, but, you know, I was going to play a good boy, do my time, get out and resume my life. I, again, this wasn't even, a, this was maybe a road, you know, a, one of those road bump things. Speed bump. Slowed me down a little bit, but, you know. And I was plotting and planning the day I got out, that I was just going to resume my life. And uh, fortunately, I didn't. Uh, fate intervened again, and I ended up getting uh, sent to treatment voluntarily. And again, you know, I, I was dead set against it, and I uh, steeled my mind with reading 
1984, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest before I got sent to treatment. And where I got sent to treatment, if you if you if you Google it, if you can remember, it's MHI in Independence, Iowa. It's a big limestone insane asylum. And the, the pictures online actually look pretty good because it's sunny. But uh, when I went, it wasn't sunny. It looked like, as my first sponsor said, the Edgar Allan Poe's uh, summer home. <laughs> But, you know, I got sent there, and, and again, you know, there was no, and, you know, you know, life's chaotic. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm waking, you know, I'm, I've got the shakes, I've got all these things, you know, and, and, and I didn't know what these things were, and, and my tolerance was in the, you know, I always prided myself. I'm a little guy, if you haven't noticed, and, and I wasn't any bigger then. Uh, the, I prided myself on being able to drink people under the table. Now, I was sloppy and stupid, and I wasn't cool about it, but... I could do it. And, you know, th my tolerance dropped, and I, I subsequently learned that that has something to do with my liver having some issues. And um, so, I mean, there was me at 22 sitting in the Black Hawk County Correctional Facility getting sent to this 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 uh, limestone insane asylum for treatment and still no anything. I was going to resume my life. And, and um, very dramatically, after my first day, I was going to check out. I didn't care what was going to happen to me. I had a two-year suspended prison sentence, and I didn't look any any further than that. I was just going to get out of that place. I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. I was going to get out because I voluntarily checked in. Ha ha! I can leave. Um, and uh, I'm leaving that place, and, and or doing the um, paperwork to leave, and I'm probably five minutes from leaving and and the thought came into my mind out of nowhere why don't you listen to what these people have to say just just like that it was my voice you know it was my head um i know what it what, where it came from now <laughs> at least i hope that's where it came from but who cares if it did uh and that got my attention and i used treatment for what it was for. It was for to wake me up and to get a look at my life. And, and you know what I discovered? I discovered I was an alcoholic, you know, a real alcoholic, you know, there was no mistaking what I was, what I was doing. And, you know, in taking the first step in surrendering to the problem and then surrendering to the solution, my first sponsor made that very clear. He's taught, he told me there were two surrenders in the first step. And, Without knowing it at the time, I did those two surrenders because I surrendered to the disease of alcoholism, which there was no mistaking, you know, and nobody who ever met me afterward had ever suggested that I wasn't, regardless of how I looked and how young I was. Um, but when I, when I, the minute I was powerless over alcohol, I did my first step out loud and I said, I just said, Andy, you're an alcoholic. And right after that, that came out of my mouth was, what were you, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And I was ready for this thing. You know, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, this young guy who thought he had, you know, 15, 20 years to do this anymore. I, for whatever reason, I knew time was running out and I didn't have time to play around with this. I don't, I don't know why looking back and, and through the course of my life since then, you know, Maybe I would have made it to 30. I kind of doubt it. Uh, maybe if I would have been locked up for any period of time after I left. And I, and I was going to drink after I left treatment. I would have been in prison by that fall. Um, I know that. And I don't know what had happened after that. And um, But I knew I didn't have time to mess around with this. Time was running out. And, and God, God, I don't know how you get here when you're 30. I don't know how you get here when you're 40. God bless you if you make it that long. Uh, if you're in your 50s, 60s, welcome. Um, but I didn't know I didn't have time to fool around with this. And I, I got this sponsor who had these blue eyes and who didn't pull any strokes. When I got out of treatment, he said to me after I asked him to sponsor me, and I got it the first Wednesday of my home group then, he said, he said sure, yeah, I'll sponsor you. He said uh, two things. He said, First off, I want you to go to at least one meeting a week that I go to so you can lie to my face. Okay, I can do that. Um, the second thing he said, he said, if I could only get to one meeting per week, which he wasn't suggesting I only go to one meeting a week, but he said, if I could only get to one meeting a week, he said, I would make it a step study. And, you know, he had a billion years. It was like 13. And... 
but he sounded like he knew what he talked was talking about, and I had no doubt to think that he didn't. And part of the second part of the surrender is surrendering to the solution. And that, even though I didn't understand it, didn't it, I wasn't jumping up and down about God's stuff or anything like that. I just, you know, as, as, as an old timer said from the podium very early on in my sobriety, I, I knew I had to take my life out of the hands of a fool. You know, I just, I just couldn't run the show anymore. You know, there was absolutely nothing in my past, in my young 22 years, that suggested that I had even an inkling of what it meant to be able to run my own life. Because there was absolutely positively nothing that I had ever done that amounted to anything. I couldn't say, well, at least, you know, I got a degree. Well, at least I got married. Well, at least I reproduced successfully. You know, I didn't have anything to hide behind because I had nothing to hide behind, you know. So surrendering to this program, regardless of how stupid it was, how scary it was. And again, when I sobered up and where I sobered up, there was not a lot of young faces in the rooms. You know, I had to identify with the Korean War POW. I had to identify with the with the biker prostitute. I had to identify with everybody, every face in that room, and I had to listen to them very carefully because I wasn't going to hear my story in the sense that sometimes we say, oh, just hang around, you'll hear your story. There wasn't much chance of that. So I had to listen deeper and hear what they were talking about in regards to this is what alcoholism is, and this is what it's going to do to you, kid, so stay here, you know. And... I got to work, and I got to work, and I got to work, and I work in the steps, and life was happening. And as I was sort of growing up spiritually and all that stuff, you know, you know, because you know we're kind of immature, um, I had to literally grow up too, you know. And I, and the only thing I can do is talk to, um, tell what it's like to sober up as a young person, and the and the. The literal growing pains we have is we're trying to sort out the alcoholism thing and trying to get straight on a number of different levels. Um, life was in progress and life was good and life was happening. Everything was at my feet. You know, my sponsor made it very clear that the only thing that I couldn't succeed at was something I didn't try. You know, and 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 that felt good because I didn't have that that going for me before I relied a little too heavily on that okay so you know as my sobriety you know really the first seven years or so I'm knocking it out of the park I'm I'm doing meetings I'm I'm sponsoring I'm I'm in service in in, in my local local uh, metro area and doing corrections and doing treatment and being literature guy and doing all these things and and you know involved in fellowship and all these things and and then all of a sudden, you know, around seven years, and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in my late twenties. Things started not necessarily going my way, you know, and and, it, and it's just it's almost like what it says the twelve and twelve. The girl I was in love with had other ideas. Aw, I only got a master's degree instead of a PhD. Aw, I had to move and take a job that was beneath me. Aw, right, and and I moved and. You know, I had nine years of sobriety, and my relationship with my sponsor, we became buddies, basically. You know, so there wasn't a whole lot of guidance, and I wasn't giving him a whole lot of stuff to give me direction on anyway, because I was like, uh, you know, I'm okay. You know, I'm still in the rooms. Meeting makers make it, don't they? I'm still in the rooms. I was still doing, you know, four or five meetings a week. I was still sponsoring people. I was still doing these things. And then when I moved, I moved to a place that was very foreign, Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> It's two hours away, so it's like Bellingham, Seattle, Tacoma kind of thing. But, you know, again, as if, if you've ever moved in sobriety, even something that small is dramatic. Because, you know, for the first nine years, that's AA. In, in a very meaningful way, that's AA. Um, so when I moved, I'm just another guy. I might have some clever things to say, um, but nobody's beating down my door asking me stuff. I have to start doing more. And at that point in time, I started taking my foot off the gas a little bit. And I was going to meetings and everything, but something was missing, and it wasn't because the AA there was weird. And it was. Uh, I don't care. It was. But my mind wasn't right, and my mind wasn't right as far as why I was there, you know. Um, 
in between, you know, that time once I moved, my my sponsor, uh, who had 25 years at the time, ended up getting drunk. Okay, and uh, and basically what it was was he stopped doing the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He never left the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He still went to meetings. He was still of service. He still sponsored people, but he stopped working the steps. He stopped applying the principles of recovery to his daily life, and it took him out. He got resentments, and I don't know what happened to him. I don't, I don't know what happened to him. I wasn't necessarily too surprised, but I mean, I'm just saying like right now, I don't know what – he could be dead right now. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then my ass started falling – sorry, my, my butt started falling off. And uh, and again, you know, I was still in the I was still trying to be of service, but I didn't understand what my mindset had to be. It wasn't about I just am of service because you know uh, the actions don't care why you take them, and you might hear that, and 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 to a certain extent, it's true. If you bring the the body, the mind will follow, and so on and so forth, and you act yourself in a new way of you know that and that kind of stuff. But after a certain point in time. Just showing up isn't enough, and just trying isn't enough. And for me, you know, my my current sponsor, and and the sponsor I chose after that, was very emphatic about love and service. You know, and 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 what that really means from a very genuine standpoint. That that's what I'm here for. That's what God's will is for me. You know, I'm going to make a bold statement and say I know what God's will is for me without reservation. It is love and service. That's all I'm here for. I, it doesn't matter what I do for a living. doesn't matter who I date. doesn't matter what car I drive. doesn't matter anything. I'm here for love and service. And that doesn't mean I don't have a regular life. I do have a regular life, and I do care about certain things. But as an alcoholic, that's what I have to focus on is love and service. And Dr. Bob talked about boiling the steps down to two principles. It would be love and service. And love and service for me is a question of, recognizing somebody else's humanity you know again this isn't like big big things it's just recognizing people as humanity because i'm selfish and self-centered to the core that's the nature of my spiritual malady as the big book tells me and i have trouble recognizing people's humanity either you're something who gives me what i want or you need to get out of my way and when i'm in those sort of mindsets i don't see you you're just you know, and I have to recognize your humanity. And when I recognize your humanity and I look at you and I see that's another human being, whether it's another alcoholic in the rooms or somebody out in the human, I can't help but love you. I can't help but love you, regardless. And then service is anything that I can contribute to your life in any meaningful way. If it's saying hello, shaking your hand or whatever. And there's other forms of love and service that were taught throughout Alcoholics Anonymous. Fortunately, I got that lesson, and Des Moines wasn't so bad after that. And then I moved to Bellingham, Washington 10 years ago. I had an opportunity. I had a friend who lived out here, and uh, I like to backpack. I'm a musician, amateur. I'm not going to make any. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, the, the backpacking is not too great in Iowa. I don't know if you've heard that or not. It's kind of flat. Um, and getting into getting into Bellingham and Western Washington and, and, and District 11, and I started getting into general service uh, um, the last couple of years in, in, in Des Moines, and District District 11 is very steeped in general service and service, and there's there's all sorts of service. So you know, if I say general service, always oh, one of those guys. No, it, it's service any any way you can do it. You know, either I'm serving Alcoholics Anonymous or serving another drunk, or I'm just trying to be decent to decent guy to another person, right? But life in in in, in Washington in Area 72 um, has been absolutely positively wonderful, regardless of what's been going on in my life. You know, one of the nice things about spiritual principles, when applied, and and when I introduce myself, I you know I don't introduce myself in the in the typical way that that I notice people in Washington State do, because I do want to thank the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 36 spiritual principles that we have in the tr steps, traditions, and concepts. All of those things are meant to do one thing. It's meant for ego deflation, sacrifice, 
me getting out of self, me getting out of the way so I can be of service to another person. When I'm focused on that kind of stuff, it does not matter what's going on in my life. Because number one, if I'm out of self-centered fear, I make good decisions around the career, the, the, the romance, the, the whatever that is. When I'm in self-centered fear, I can't make a good decision. And that's all I have to say tonight. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenton, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, the worst. Um, thanks. I, uh, I'm a little nervous to be up here. I, uh, my sobriety date is uh, June 21st, 1995, and uh, I have a home group. I have a sponsor. I sponsor other men. And uh, I have to say, I am uh, really surprised to still be sober today and to still be here. Uh, this was not <laughs> part of my plan. I, uh, I never intended to stay sober this long. Um, I never... Uh, I just, I just couldn't imagine it for myself. It was just not part of, uh, part of the plan for me. And, um, and I also confess, uh, I first started coming to this meeting uh, a couple years ago. And the first time I came, the main speaker, like just ran out of stuff to say within like, you know, 15 minutes left and the meeting got out early. And so I thought that was really cool. I'm going to come coming back and, uh, you know, get some more Sunday night back. And I got to admit, there's a 50, 50 chance this meeting's getting out early tonight. So, uh, <laughs> You know, just uh, bear with me. But um, I will say uh, that my life today is so much better than anything I ever, ever could have asked for myself. And that is all due to, you know, the grace of God and the fellowship and steps of this program. Um, and it is just, you know, uh, I just had no concept of what I wanted, you know, when I got here. Um, when I got here, I, I really wanted the pain to stop. I thought AA was going to suck. And, uh, and I thought maybe, maybe I'll win the lottery or I'll get famous. Like that's the only possible good thing I could see coming from AA. Uh, when people read the promises, like didn't mean anything to me. I didn't want any part of that. Like that just didn't, it didn't sound appealing to me at all. Um, because I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't know what I wanted. I had no idea what was good for me, what made me happy. Like I just, I just wasn't in touch with anything. And, uh, and today I can honestly say, uh, the things that mean the most to me today are, you know, the relationship that I have with my higher power, you know, the love of my family and friends, uh, you know, a sense of peace and ease, a comfort in my skin, you know, things that money can't buy. And, uh, and that, that is not something I ever would have expected. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, probably one of the main themes of what AA has given to me is really just the ability to uh, do the opposite of what my head tells me to do and to do, you know, things that don't make sense. And, and by doing that, um, you know, my life has gotten a lot better uh, than anything I, I could have asked for. So um, I'll back up and, uh, you know, tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, I, I like, you know, I want to thank the first speaker. I really, uh, I really related a lot, uh, to what, what she had to say. And, you know, I came from a pretty normal middle-class, uh, Virginia upbringing and, uh, on the outside, everything looked normal. Um, you know, we went to church, we went to a good school system, you know, everything was fine. And, uh, and I wasn't a great student, but I wasn't a bad student. I was just kind of average, you know, and, uh, and I, I kind of fit in, but I, I, I fit in and I had friends, but I always felt like I was missing something. Like I always felt like, like there were just things that other people seemed to know how to do that I just didn't get. And, uh, and I didn't, I couldn't, I, I could never really articulate it, but I just always felt a little different. And, uh, and, and, and I always kept secrets. Um, I just, I felt like there were a lot of things that I just could never tell anybody and that I could never be honest about. And uh, if, if I was feeling something or thinking something, I just, I knew I couldn't, I couldn't tell it. I just had to lie about it. And I don't know where that came from. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when I was 11 years old, um, it was the first time I got drunk. And, uh, and at that point, my friends had already started drinking a couple of them just on the weekends. And I, at that, that point before that, I was like the responsible one. I was the guy who was like trying to, you know, make sure we didn't get caught and like trying to keep everybody quiet. And that really sucked. You know, that was, it was, it was annoying. And then, uh, one night I, I went out with, um, it was over the summer and my friend's cousin was in town and, uh, this kid was a few years older and he was cool. He was from Chicago. Uh, his mom sent him to live with, uh, with, uh, my friend's mom because he was getting into too much trouble. And, uh, and he, 
he beat the beat us up and uh and then after he was you know done uh he decided to get drunk and he took pity on us and gave us a little bit of his and and i got i got drunk and uh and i loved it you know i absolutely loved it we went out that night and we were breaking into cars and we were taking people's cigarettes and smoking and spray painting walls and like throwing eggs. It's like just doing all the kind of like dumb stuff little kids do. And I felt like a man for the first time in my life. Like that was the best time I ever could have. We, we got, we got arrested. We got caught by the cops, like being, being dumb. And, uh, and, and, and it didn't change. You know, I got drunk, beat up and arrested my first night drinking. And that like literally set the stage for the next, you know, seven, eight years. Like basically that was the rest of my story right there. And, uh, but, but it didn't, you know, you couldn't tell me like a normal person probably would have gone the next day and said, ah, oh, that sucks, man. I'm not going to do that. You know, and me, I couldn't wait to do it again. And, uh, and it was tough. You know, I look at 11 year olds now and I am like, my God, they are so friggin' young, you know, and so innocent looking. And like, me, like at that point, I, I honestly, honestly believed I had arrived. Like I didn't need to learn anything else from anybody. I was a man. I could take care of myself. Thank you very much. And like, and that's how I, I went. I, I stopped eating lunch at school. Um, so I could, I saved my lunch money. So on the weekends, you know, I could, I could have beer money and we would go down to the 7-Eleven and get homeless guys to buy us beer. And, uh, or we'd have to stand and just ask folks, you know, would you buy a spear? Would you buy a spear? You know, and most of and people like now, I don't know if people still do that, but like, it didn't normally take very long. Like people would, would buy a spear. And, uh, and then, you know, like the friends that I had, uh, who were, who were drinking like that, um, they were pretty happy to just do it on the weekends, you know, and I don't know why I wasn't like, I needed it more. And so I, I very quickly changed friends and I found the guys who were, doing other stuff and doing it more often. And they were older than me. And I thought I was cool because I was hanging out with these guys. And, uh, and it just, you know, it set up a pattern, uh, which, you know, what like I talked about, you know, kept, I, I got on probation that night and I basically, I stayed on probation from 11 to 18 and, uh, and there was a ton of <laughs> dumb, stupid, uh, institutions, detention centers, rehabs, a bunch of them. And they don't, like, yeah, it's, it was dumb. Um, and, uh, but, but like, I thought that was cool. Like I really did. Like I thought that made me tough or that made me something. And, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, like I, I honestly thought I could quit if I wanted to, you know, but why would I want to like this alcohol did for me something that it doesn't do for normal people, you know? And, and it, it quickly became my, my solution, my best friend, like closer to me than, than anything else. And, uh, and I remember looking at kids my own age uh, at my school, because I went to a really good public school, and uh, and most of the kids didn't weren't doing the things that I was doing, and uh, and I felt really sorry for them. You know, they didn't have this thing, they didn't have this tool. They were like they were missing out, and um and and I didn't care that I was like making really bad life decisions. Like it didn't, it really didn't phase me. You know, like other kids were studying for college and were like getting you know, making plans for their lives. I had no plan for my life whatsoever. Like I was gonna drink as much as I could, every chance I could. And that was it. That was my only plan. As long as I could keep drinking, that's all that I wanted to do. And, um, and so that's what I did. And, and, you know, it was, it was a rather quick change. Um, you know, I, overnight, I basically changed all my friends, goals, everything else just went out the window. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I didn't see any problem with that. Um, the first time I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 15 years old and, uh, and I was court ordered. And in and my mind at that time, AA was just another authority figure in my life. You know, I was, I was convinced that anything I said in a meeting would get back to my probation officer. It would get back to my counselor. Um, and that people here were just like trying to tell me what to do and how I'd live my own life. And, uh, and I, I looked at the third step and I, I was convinced AA was a cult, you know, <laughs> I mean, very simple, you know, turn my will and my life over to the care of God. Like that seemed horrible. You know, that, that seemed obviously like that's, that's a cult. And, uh, and, and I, I just didn't want any part of it. And, uh, and I, I should back up again too at that. So I grew up, I grew up with the church, you know, we went to church every Sunday and, uh, and I wasn't super religious or super into it. Um, but I was like, I kind of thought, yeah, maybe there's, there's this thing. And, uh, and over the course of my drinking, I quickly shut that door. 
And uh, I quickly had, you know, the big book and the 12 and 12 talk a lot about this. You know, I had a lot of reasons why religion was dumb and why uh, there just couldn't be anything like that. And so so my idea of faith just was none. I, I didn't have any. And uh, and so I saw the God word a lot in on the steps. And that that really shut me off and turned me down. And um, and one of the things that people would say in treatment and I would hear at AA meetings is, you know, God, as you understand him. And uh, and I know that helps a lot of people, uh, but my mind is like really twisted and sick. And I, I twist everything around. And when I when I would hear people say, God, as you understand him, I said, you know, in my head was like, oh, well, let's just make believe, you know, like if, if, if I can make up my own God, then this is just pretend, you know, like that's proof that there is no God. If I can just make it up, like, you know, either it is or it isn't like I can't I can't make up a God. And um, and so so as long as I had my so my door was shut. You know, I, I had no faith. I wasn't going to reach out. I, I, wh why even pray? Because there's nothing there. And, um, and you know, I, I had an old sponsor back in Virginia. And, you know, he used to always say, God is a perfect gentleman and absolutely will not remove anything from me that I'm not willing to let go of yet. And, uh, and I, I believe that to be true. Um, and, and I should also stop and just say, you know, when I say God, I'm still not religious. You know, for me, it's just it's easier to say God than higher power, spirit of the universe, life, all that is whatever, whatever it is you want to substitute for the word God or whatever. Like, that's what I use. I just say God because it's easier. I don't claim to know what or what it is at all. Um, but that's uh, that's where I was. And so. So I, I didn't like AA. I was very paranoid, and um, and I, I I didn't see the point in going. You know, honestly, like I would just sign my own slips, um, and I didn't see. You know, I had no intention, like I said, of getting sober. People in AA annoyed me. Uh, every everything about people in AA annoyed me. The meetings were too long. People talked too much about themselves. They were corny <laughs> jokes. Bad coffee. I was the youngest person by far in any meeting and I just didn't, there was nothing there that I wanted. And, um, and so I, I didn't go. And, uh, and I was, I was able to get away with that for a little while um, until this girl, Ashley in my treatment group came along and, uh, and Ashley was the only person in all of the rehabs I went to that actually wanted to be sober. Like she <laughs> really wanted to be sober and she worked it really hard and she called me out every group, like every, every meeting we went to, I would, I'd sign my slip and she'd be like, he wasn't there. I was there. He didn't go to that meeting. <laughs> you know, I'd come in and I know this is I, I would come in high and she'd be like, he's high. Look at his eyes. Give him the test, you know? And, uh, she just, she had it in for me. And, uh, and so I, um, I, I knew I had to, I had to get her on my side, you know, I had to. Because, like, all I, all I wanted out of life at this point was to get off probation, to stop having to pee in a cup, and just be able to drink the way I wanted to. Like, that's all I wanted out. Like, I, I figured if I had no authority figures in my life, like, everything would be great. And um, and so, uh, and I had this system, like, drug tests back then weren't as good as they are today. You know, like, I could... I would drink vinegar before I went in. I would drink cranberry juice, lots of water. And like half the time that worked, like half the time I could get away with, with tests, but most of the time, sometimes I still fail them. And, uh, and I was just, you know, so, so I had this brilliant idea that I would, I would, I would get Ashley, uh, I would, I would get Ashley to take me to some meetings and I would, I would convince her that I wanted to be sober and, uh, she would vouch for me to my counselor. My counselor would vouch for me to my probation officer I'd be able to get to go back to drinking the way I wanted to, and uh, that was my plan. That was my best thinking, and uh, and and something happened. It it backfired. Um, I <laughs> I I started to go to meetings, and and then I would have like these trick questions. You know, my probation officer would say, you know, would you do this weekend? And uh, and I had no idea what sober people did on their weekends. Like I had no, I I really didn't know how people spent their time. And so I would I would say like, okay, I'm gonna go to meetings. I'll listen to what people are saying, so I have good lies that I could tell my counselors and my probation officer. Like, I'm just going here to get material. And, uh, and, and I started to really identify with these people. And, um, and I started to hear people's stories, and it started to sink in. And it was really gradual and really slow. And the God stuff still freaked me out. And I still wasn't ready to, like, do it. But I believed in the people in the meetings. And I believed in the power in the meetings. Like, I got, there was no doubt that there was something happening 
in AA meetings that was was powerful and that that you know people's lives were changing. I had no doubt about it. Like when people would talk about their lives and how good they were, I believed everything that they said. Um, I still didn't like them and I still didn't want to spend any time with them, but I I believed them. And um, but I thought you know I could really manage it my my own way. And uh, the next couple of years were really painful and uh slow and it was a lot of half measures and a lot of kind of wanting to be sober kind of not you know and still like being stuck in these two worlds and like trying it my own way and uh and it was it it was it was really painful like i didn't i didn't i definitely wasn't with the sober crowd i wasn't willing to go all in i wasn't you know i didn't wasn't going to get a sponsor there was a lot of things that i wasn't going to do um but it was really ruining my drinking too and, uh, and it was always late at night, you know, when I was around other people, I was okay, but it was late at night when I couldn't sleep and I'd just be laying there. And then I would start to get the voices and I would start to remember the things that I'd heard in a meeting. And this voice would say, that could be you, you know, like you're blowing it. Like you've got this chance, you know, you, you, that person had a great life, you know, why don't, why about you? And, uh, and then I would drink again and, you know, something would happen and I, it just, it, it just, it was, it was bad. And, um, so while this was going on, um, I still, I still wasn't ready to get on. Uh, I still had a problem with God. I still had a problem with, with higher powers and all this. And, uh, and I was still honestly was enjoying drinking. I was, I was mad at the courts. I was mad at AA cause I felt entitled cause of how young I was, you know, I, I was just too young to get sober and, uh, and I was in a bad spot. I knew, uh, my probation officer, I uh, had said that if I failed another drug test, she was going to send me to detention. And so um, so I voluntarily put myself in a 30-day re- treatment center because I figured if I voluntarily put myself in, then maybe she'll take pity on me and think I'm serious, whatever. And uh, so I put myself in there, and I'd gotten, uh, I'd gotten beat up before then, and these guys, they broke my ankle. And uh, so I'm in this rehab. They're taking us to meetings every day. I'm on crutches. Like my first day there, I don't know how, but I get like all these spider bites on my face. So like my face is swollen up. I look like the elephant man. I'm on crutches and I'm just, I'm detoxing. I am the most miserable person you've ever seen in your life. And I'm just hobbling around just like a big ball of hate. Like that's all I can do. And and every meeting for two weeks, every meeting I went to, the topic was resentment. And... Uh, <laughs> And all I kept hearing at every meeting was, you should pray for the people that you're angry at. If you're mad at somebody, you should pray for them. If you're mad at somebody, you should pray for them. And this whole time, um, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with my brother, and I'm trying to get him to uh, to sneak me some some stuff into the treatment center. And, uh, and he won't do it. Um, but when he comes to visit me, he tells me that this guy that we used to, to party with uh, has told my girlfriend I cheated on her, my boss that I was stealing from him, and like, He's going behind my back and just screwing me in all of these ways possible. And so all my rage is just focused at this guy. And uh, and I'm, I'm laying in bed one night, and it's like 1 in the morning. I can't sleep. And I'm just so exhausted and so miserable. Um, you know, like all the walls have kind of fallen down. And something inside of me just says, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I pray for this guy that I'm mad at. And uh, for the first time since I was there, I just I fall right asleep. You know, and I, I, I don't, I didn't even realize it, but I just, I fell right asleep. And, uh, a couple of days later, my brother comes to visit me and tells me that this guy that I, I prayed for his, uh, his girlfriend got a restraining order on him. He got fired from his job, beat up, uh, OD'd on his grandmother's medicine, wrecked the car, got arrested and, and in the hospital. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's why they tell you to pray for people, you know, <laughs> God, uh. God, can you better revenge than you can? And uh, I will say nothing like that has ever happened since. Um, you know, but but I do get the peace. You know, when I pray for somebody that I'm resentful at uh, today, I do get that same peace, and that that's worth more than than anything else. But so what that did, that was the first real prayer I'd ever said, and uh, and it it broke. Um, you know, it, it broke the wall down for me. And, uh, and I honestly, I didn't even stay sober after that. I, I got out of that rehab and, uh, and went out a couple more times. And, um, but it, it changed, it changed, it changed something for me. You know, I could no longer say without a doubt, there was no power greater than myself. 
because something had happened and I knew and ever since and and, and after that point you know um it just kind of stuck with me and it, it just sort of laid in the back of my head and um and I went I I, I get sober uh so fast forward a little bit I got sober for about a year and um and in the year I don't know how I stayed sober for this year but I stayed sober a year and in that year I get everything that I'd wanted out of life you know not very much at this point. I, I graduated high school. I, I got off probation. I had a girlfriend, a job, a car, and uh, and I thought life was pretty good, you know. And uh, and and I I get this idea, maybe I can drink again, you know. I've been around AA a long time. I've been in treatment a long time. I know how this whole thing works. I can go out for one night, get drunk, and just come back the next day like nothing happened. And everything will be fine. I'll, I'll be able to keep all these things, all these wonderful things in my life. I'll be able to keep them. And, uh, you know, because I'd seen this happen in AA meetings. I'd seen people come in and uh, and everybody welcomes them back and gives them their numbers. And I was like, you know, it'll be cool. Like everybody will be, everybody will be okay with it, you know. And, uh, and I didn't make the decision to drink. Um, but I just kind of had this door open. And, uh, and then a couple weeks later, uh, some guys I work with who... Um, you know, I didn't tell I didn't tell them that I was sober <laughs> at all. Uh, one day they just came up to me and offered me something, and without even thinking about it, I took it, and uh, and, I, and I was off to the races. And I didn't get drunk that night. I just had a little bit, and so I thought, well, I'm not going to change my date if I didn't get drunk, you know. So I went out again, and this time I got drunk, and uh, and that was and then I couldn't stop. You know, at that point. Uh, it was six more months of in and out and in and out and in and out. And it was the scariest I've ever been. It was, I've never felt powerlessness like that, you know, of, you know, having this head full of AA and, uh, and really like, I thought, I thought I could control my sobriety. Like I thought I could manage my sobriety, manage my life and, uh, and just quit whenever I wanted to. And, and that obsession came back like, like nothing I'd ever seen before. You know, some people say that it, it stops, where you left off. And I don't think it stops where you left off. I think it's, it picks up where you'd be if you'd never stopped, you know? I mean, that's where it was with me. Like I was going full speed and, uh, and I just, I could, I would, I was still going to meetings though. I was still going to meetings every day. And, um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. And, um, and something happened and, uh, and it wasn't anything on the outside. Um, you know, I lost everything, <laughs> everything. I was, you know, girl left, job left, car broke down. I was sleeping in my car that didn't work and, uh, and had been for a couple of months and, uh, and, and nothing else had changed. But one day, um, something on the inside of me changed and I, I figured I had three options. You know, I could, I could just give up on AA and just drink. I could just go get sober or I could kill myself. And, uh, and I knew I had to do one of these three things. Um, but they all, and they all looked bad. Like not one of these answers looked any better than the other one. They, they were all at the bottom of the list. Like I, but I, and I honestly didn't know what to do. Um, but I remembered that prayer that I had, I had said a while, you know, before. And, uh, and so I prayed and I said, if there's anything out there, whatever it is, just push me in one direction or the other. You know, I don't care what it is, like, just push me in one direction or the other. I can't keep going in and out like this. And uh, that was that was the day before my sobriety date. I, I haven't had a drink or a drug since then. And I haven't had the desire for a drink or a drug since then. And um, and I am truly grateful for that. You know, um, that is is it's been an absolute miracle. Um, and uh, and so after that, I. I started coming back to meetings and I got a sponsor and, uh, and I was a different sponsor and they said, you know, get a sponsor who has what you want. And, uh, and this guy was happy. He was funny. He was involved. He was, in, he went to a lot of meetings and he was really, you know, he was doing it. And so, so that's the guy I picked. And, uh, and he got me involved in a lot of service work right off the bat. Um, there was a, a Tuesday and Friday night meeting that I went to with him and <laughs> he made me the, Coffee maker, cleanup, setup, literature, <laughs> secretary. Like, I think I pretty much had every service position at these two meetings, and I did it for, like, six months. And uh, and, and there was an AA clubhouse in Virginia um, that had a coffee bar, and I worked at the coffee bar. Uh, that wasn't AA, but that was the only job I could get. And uh, and I, I just got really, really busy. And, and I had a car that, you know, I got the car fixed, and I just was giving you guys a ride. Uh, and I just was doing a lot of stuff and I was, I was really active and, um, and that, that worked, you know, that, that, 
uh, things started to change. You know, I, um, I, I started to, to feel better. And, um, when I had about six months, um, I remember I was really upset and, uh, I, I don't even remember what I was so upset about, but I remember, I think, well, it doesn't matter. I was, I was upset <laughs> and I pulled into my service position and I like peeled the car and I'm like slamming doors and I'm, you know, kicking stuff and I'm all huffing and puffing. And, uh, and something happened by the time I got done setting the church up, like I couldn't, I couldn't even remember what I was so upset about, you know? And, uh, and I was like the first time that I'd realized that like there was an actual power to doing stuff for others and to service work and, and why I was doing as much as I was doing. And, uh, and so, you know, I started doing the phones down at inner group, which I still do and love. And, um, and, you know, we went to AA bingos and dances and everything, you name it. And, um, and that worked for a while. Um, until I guess I had about a year and a half, two years. Um, I hit, I just, I hit a wall. Like, I don't, I can't describe it. You know, I know this, everybody, I think everybody's program is a little bit different. Um, but, uh, I hit this wall where I, I just wasn't feeling, you know, I started to want, you know, I was, I was still a really young guy and I was still going to, you know, most of the meetings I was going to, I would see people who had these amazing lives and, uh, and my life still kind of sucked. You know, I was, I was living in my parents' basement. I was making, working at this coffee house. My girlfriend was pregnant with somebody else's kid. Uh, I had no future job. Like things, things, things were not really going that well in my life. Uh, I was sober. Yes. You know, like I wasn't drinking, but, uh, but you know, I, I felt like there was still more that I was missing. And, um, and so I started to, I started to blame AA and, uh, and so, so I went up to this old timer and he was like the happiest guy that I've ever seen or met in a meeting. He was 70 something, 38 years sober. And I never actually talked to him before this, but I'd always, I'd watched him at meetings and he just had, he was just the most grateful, gracious, loving old man I'd ever met. And, uh, and so I go up to him after the meeting, I get in his face and I'm like, is this all there is? You know, is this all A has to offer? And, uh, and he very lovingly, you know, puts his arm on my shoulder and says, yes, if this is all you're willing to do, this is all you're going to get. And he walks away. <laughs> and I was like, well, oh, he doesn't know me. Like, what is he? Like, have him. And, uh, you know, a month later, I, I asked him to be my sponsor and, uh, and we started working through the steps. And that was something that I had never really done before. You know, I, uh, I had been really involved in the fellowship of AA, um, but I hadn't really done, uh, the rest of the work. And, um, and for me, I think the fellowship is still an important part of my life. You know, I, I believe it's the bandage that stops the bleeding, you know, but the real healing, uh, I think comes from, from the steps and from, from the grace, from a higher power. You know, that's just my personal opinion, you know, I, but I, I need it all. And, um, and so we got into the steps and, uh, and through going through the steps, one of the things that I realized, um, you know, I, I had believed that there was this higher power, but since I had asked, I didn't realize I had asked him to help me stop drinking. And since that had happened, I, I just didn't feel like I could ask him for anything else, you know? And so the rest of my life, I was managing myself and I was running my own life. And, um, you know, and I had no problem believing that, like, God could do all these wonderful things. AA could do all these wonderful things for everybody here. I just didn't think it would work for me. Like, I didn't think uh, I didn't think it would. And so why bother? Why try? You know, it was that same thing again. And uh, but we but we went through the steps. And uh, and when we went through the steps, things started to change in my life. And, um, and I started to get that peace. I started to get, you know, that gratitude, uh, that I was seeing with other people. And, um, and then, you know, other things started to change in my life too. I, um, I had got a different job. Uh, I was working with this guy, Dan, uh, who was in the program and, and we detailed cars. Well, he, he had his own car detailing business and, and I loved it. Dan was awesome. He had been sober 12 years. He got sober really young like me. And, uh, and I really looked up to this guy and, uh, it was hard work, but like at the end of the day, like I felt good and I don't know, I just, I really enjoyed this job. And, uh, and one day Dan fires me <laughs> and he doesn't say why he just says, we don't need you anymore. And he fires me. And, uh, and I was, I was devastated. You know, it was the first time I'd been fired sober and I was like, what the, you know, I'm like doing everything. Like I, I took it really personally. And, uh, a couple of weeks go by and, um, and I see Dan at a meeting and he pulls me aside, uh, at halftime and he's like, let's, you know, let's go out in the parking lot and talk. And, um, so we go outside and for like 
half hour, he just starts laying into me. You know, what are you doing with your life? You know, like you're sober. You could do anything you want to do. You know, you could be anything you want to be. You know, don't end up like me detailing cars the rest of your life. Like if you want to be a doctor, be a doctor. If you want to be a lawyer, be a lawyer. Go to school, you know, do do, do something with your life. And I was like, I was so taken back, you know, it had never occurred to me that I could go to school. Like it had never occurred to me that I could do anything with my life now that I was sober. And, uh, and, and so, you know, like this guy changed my life, you know, that day I went home and, uh, signed up for community college and, and started taking courses. Um, you know, I went to my parents and I was like really excited and <laughs> they were not quite, uh, there, they, you know, said, get a job, uh, you know, and I don't blame them. Like I, there was nothing in me growing up that said college material, you know, and, and any, any, any money they might've put aside for college got quickly eaten up in lawyers and treatment centers and whatever. So I, I understand their skepticism and, um, you know, but, but by practicing the principles of all my affairs and, and, you know, doing the things uh, that people taught, I was able to go back to school and it took a couple of years, but I, I did it. And, um, and I got to tell you, I felt like a phony, like every day I would walk in and I would feel like that punk kid on the street. And I felt like people knew and I felt like people could see it. And, uh, but, you know, with the tools of this program, you know, I was able to fake it till I make it. I was able to reach out for help when I needed it and just show up and do the work. You know, and that's what this program has taught me, that if I do the work, despite what I think about it, you know, amazing things can happen. And uh, and that has been true over and over and over again in, you know, every aspect of my life. And, um, you know, I'm just I'm just really grateful for that. And uh, and this program has been, you know, such a huge blessing in my life. Um, you know, I uh, after I graduated, I, I got a bunch of different jobs and I, I traveled all over the country um, doing things that I never thought I'd be able to do doing, I, I worked in an industry for a long time that I was really passionate about and loved. And, uh, and it was amazing. You know, I, it was, it was great. Um, uh, well, okay. So at about 10 years sober, I had, uh, I had been doing, working in this field for a long time and I'd gotten really successful at it and I was moving up the chains and I was, I was doing all these things. And, uh, my program really started to suffer because I was on the road all the time and I was working like 80 out, you know, not, I was working a lot and, uh, and I didn't realize it at the time. Um, but I had, you know, I had been through the steps and I, had, you know, worked with other people and was sponsoring other people, but you know, this thing gradually, uh, comes back and, um, and at about 10, 11 years sober, um, I, I started to get back into the steps and, uh, you know, had a sponsor. We were going through the big book together and we got to the bedevilments. And I had every single one of those things, you know, um, loneliness, despair, emotionally all over the place. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's just a reminder that like I have alcoholism, you know, it's a corny saying, but you know, I have alcoholism, not alcoholism, you know, like I need to keep, uh, I need to keep doing this thing, you know? And so, um, you know, I need to give it away to keep it. Like I can't, I can't rest on the fact that, you know, I did the steps a long time ago. Like I need to keep doing them again. I need to keep practicing these principles. And, uh, and so, you know, so at 10 years sober, I, I go through the steps again and, uh, had to make some serious life changes. And, uh, at the same time, I also met my, my wonderful wife and, um, you know, like things, things change. Like that's, that's something that I never thought was going to be possible for myself. Um, but it's, it's, it's just been amazing. I, um, I don't know. There's, uh, we moved to Seattle a few years ago and, uh, it's been, it's been an amazing trip. You know, when I got sober, I honestly never thought I would get outside of Virginia. <laughs> I thought, you know, if I lived to see 25, it was going to be cause I was in jail or something. Like I really, I, I had no, uh, I just had no plan for my life and, and what AA has given me has been so much better, um, at, at every level. And I need to remind myself that like, I don't know what's going to happen. And, and but, so, so when I, when I listen to my, when I, when I get away from my higher power, when I get away from the program, my head just like narrows my life. And I don't, I don't, drinking doesn't, isn't the first thing that I think about. Like nowadays drinking almost, narrow, I almost don't never think about it, but I think about, isolating. I think about killing myself. I think about acting out in all these other, you know, destructive ways. And, uh, and that's what'll get me drunk, you know, living, acting out like that, that'll, uh, that'll do that. So 
I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk and to be of service and to have everybody here in my life. I got to say, moving in sobriety is probably one of the hardest things to do. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people in this room who have been in the same boat and who have been there to help. And, uh, you know, we've got meetings everywhere. So, um, yeah. So thank you all very much. And uh, thanks for letting us stay sober. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.